Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to the Madden America podcast. I'm Micah Engel, a doctoral student in psychology, consciousness, and society at the University of West Georgia, as well as a research news writer for the Madden America website. Today, I'm joined by Alice and Ken Thompson. Alice Fox Thompson is currently in her fourth year of medical school at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. She plans to begin her residency in psychiatry at UT Austin Dell Medical School in June of 2022. Before medical school, Alice worked in community organizing and advocacy. She is interested in solidarity-based approaches to community and population mental health. Kenneth Thompson is a psychiatrist trained at the Boston University School of Medicine. He did his psychiatric residency at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, New York, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in mental health services at Yale University. He has served as faculty at Yale University and the University of Pittsburgh and has been the director of many different psychiatric clinics. Ken currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer of the Pennsylvania Psychiatric Leadership Council, a unique state-level education policy and advocacy organization that he helped found. He continues to offer and oversee mental health services at several mental health and community mental health centers. Ken's focus as a psychiatrist has always been on social medicine and community psychiatry, having written, consulted, and lectured extensively on issues of public service, whole person, primary health services, health equity, democracy, human rights, and more. As father and daughter, Ken and Alice run the Visible Hands Collaborative, a project in Pittsburgh which aims to bring a novel form of community healing to to the United States. Uh, Thank you both for speaking with me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Micah. All right, so let's jump jump right in here. So can you introduce yourselves and talk briefly about your respective backgrounds, uh, either as individuals in the healing professions, community organizers, whatever you feel is relevant? Sure. Hi, I'm Alice Thompson. I am a graduating medical student at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, and I came to medicine a little bit late. Um, I actually started out my post-college professional life as a um, as a community organizer, and I worked in several political campaigns as well as a field organizer. And you know, I, I feel like I came to medicine from a different way than most people do. You know, I really had been inspired by all of the community work that I had done, and particularly my volunteers that I worked with regularly, who came from a wide variety of backgrounds, but often the most um, historically traumatized communities in Pittsburgh. And, you know, they struggled, many of them struggled with severe mental and physical disabilities and and health challenges. And it was sort of the thing that inspired me to want to go to medicine was because I saw that these folks really struggled and struggled with access and struggled with having, um, you know, physicians, but not just physicians, uh, professionals around them who didn't quite see the situations that they were living in um, face to face and didn't really know how to deal with this, the types of challenges that they were facing. And so I was really inspired to go into medicine as someone who would work with those communities in ways that perhaps other more science based, um, uh, science educated backgrounded people didn't really focus on as much. You know, I really came at the, the, the medicine that I was looking at and the type of work that I wanted to do from a community standpoint. And I wanted to find really novel approaches that could do this, um, while taking into account the impact that working on a community level really has for people. 
I was really excited about hearing about integrative community therapy because it was such a beautiful approach to the the things that I kind of love the most about uh, working in in the field that I work in, um, you know, bring together community members to understand each other and sort of break down the walls that divide us while also um, doing it in a way that is trauma-informed while taking into account the ways that individuals also experience uh, their own mental health challenges. Thank you. Uh, Ken? Well, as you can imagine, um, for the last number of years, the, the main goal that I've had is to just make sure I don't get in Alice's way to do the things that she was just describing um, and uh, to do what I can to help uh, help her go in the direction she wants to go. And that, I think, is uh, maybe that's a way to introduce myself as a psychiatrist. I've been working in this field now for almost 40 years. Actually, it is 40 years um, since I started my residency. And um, I've um, always been a uh, psychiatrist interested in uh, um, the relationship between between people and the place and the communities in which they live in, and um, had a long-standing interest in what are called therapeutic communities, which we used to have in um, in hospitals when people stayed in hospitals long enough to be in a kind of a community. Um, that obviously had some very serious drawbacks that you would actually be in a community in a hospital as opposed to being in a community in a community. Um, but it was still, I think, a, um, a an, an interesting way of imagining that it was, it was important for people to have relationships with other people for their own healing and for the healing of the overall community. So, um, so I've worked in outpatient psychiatry for most of my career. I've had uh, stints in a range of places, you know, from from jails to um, uh, to state hospitals, um, but most of the time it's always been back into the community and community settings and community psychiatry, uh, with a particular interest in um, in public health, trying to imagine what we could do to help uh, people not have to show up with psychiatric challenges in the first place. What are things that we could do to actually prevent or promote health and well-being so that folks didn't have to go through any suffering at all or the least amount of suffering possible? Um, that was also very much tied to the notion of recovery, which is a, uh, a concept which has really sort of unfolded over the course of my career. And uh, I was um, I was lucky enough to be involved with some key leaders out of the uh, consumer movement um, who particularly uh, guided me in that uh, work a long time ago. Clearly, what we want to do is try to find out ways to help people have the lives that they want to live. and And on top of that, create settings and places where it was possible for people to have the lives they wanted to live. And on top of that, where the hurts and the uh, and the ch challenges and the pains um, that have been inflicted, the traumas, um, the 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 um, experiences of diversity in human in humankind, are are seen as values, as seen as valuable, and um, and that we find a way to uh, create a human network that is um, stitched together and is um, uh, based on everybody's well-being. So that's been a basic sort of premise. What happened to me and that got me to uh, to Alice and what she's been looking at and I've been working with her on is um, and working in a community mental health center or a federally qualified health center, you know, I see a, I see a lot of patients, but when I think about the number of patients that I see, it's a tiny number of people. Um, and um, it's... Uh, uh, and even then, I don't see people for as much or as often as sometimes I would like to because the sheer number of people who need to be seen is just so mag has such a magnitude. And I'm hopeful that we're at least helpful in some way to them in that process. But I've been looking for ways to figure out how to broaden the capacity of, of people to find health and well-being that would build on um, what I've been learning in recovery, which is that everybody's got assets and capabilities and, and capacities that 99% of the time we forget to check and we forget to um, we forget to uh, tie into. Um, so, um, so what really got me going with uh, ICT or the integrative community therapy or um, what I when I originally heard about it was just called community therapy was uh, that. Um, uh, a psychiatrist in Brazil in a, um, in of all places, a, a favela 
which is in, in the American term, that would be basically a shanty town, um, a place that's been constructed out of anything that people can find and built on land that doesn't belong to them theoretically, um, and that can be knocked down and you know by the police whenever they feel like it. And folks who end up there are people who've migrated from really even worse situations. So you can only imagine. Uh, the challenges that folks have. So this psychiatrist is in a favela trying to help people. Um, and he realizes that if he's doing what I've been doing for the last 30 years, which is to see one person at a time, he will see, you know, the very tip of the finger. <laughs> he won't see very much of what's going on and he'll be less able to help people. Um, not only because his own powers are limited, but because we're not actually tying into the challenges that people actually face. So he sat down and in combination with the favela, with the people from the favela, um, he noticed that um, when people were struggling, that the, that the other people in the favela would often offer various kinds of comfort, something that we also see. Ways of trying to help people manage very difficult and challenging emotions and experiential states, that they would come to people and make that um, um, make that kind of uh, express that kind of solidarity. Uh, so he saw that, and what he started to do with the favela, with the folks in the favela, is is to organize that as a process, which is um, called integrative community therapy, and has some features to it, which we can obviously we'll talk about, but. What it allowed him to do was to start to uh, work with groups of people that get to be as large as you know, sometimes a couple hundred, most of the time probably somewhere between 15 and 40, 50, something like that, and to and to do what um what I think, uh, Micah, you picked up in your description of this, um, not just healing individuals, but healing communities, that it's an exercise in community healing as well as trying to help people uh, figure out how to address the challenges they have. That kind of thinking is exactly what I've been looking for for a long time. So you've both mentioned uh, integrative community therapy, which is, as far as I've been able to take a look at it, a really unique model of practice for community healing. Uh, can you give our listeners a primer on sort of what exactly it is? How it, You talked a little bit about how it started, but if there's anything to add there and then sort of how it works. Integrative community therapy is a an open, large group dialogic practice that is meant to take place with, you know, between 15 and 200 people to discuss the emotional distresses that individuals bring to a, a community, but also to create a universal approach to those same emotional distresses. So... To describe sort of the structure, it's a five-step facilitated dialogue. Um, each member of the or participant of the group is there to participate on any level that they feel um, inclined to do. So you can spend the entire time contributing, answering the questions as they come, um, you know, uh, sharing things that as you're invited to share them, or you can sit there and not say a thing, listen to the entire um, conversation without, uh, you know, per engaging specifically um, based on your experience at all. Um, the five steps go through welcoming, celebrations, and uh, a dynamic. We also have uh, rules uh, that we engage in. I can describe those a little bit as well. Um, but so, so the first step is composed of a welcome, describing the sort of ground rules that we all engage in while we're together, uh, celebrations. So we invite people to celebrate, you know, whatever it is that they had a birthday party or that someone was born or, you know, just that they got out of bed that morning. Um, and then we close step one with a, what we call a dynamic or an icebreaker or mindfulness exercise, just sort of something to get us present in the moment. Then step two is where we ask people to share a struggle that they're facing, an emotional distress that's been bothering them or weighing on them or feels like it's holding them back in some way. We ask, you know, maybe four or five people, depending on the size of the group, um, it can be more or less. 
And so we, we collect what we call pebbles. Um, this is based off of a quote. We, we often use the uh, Muhammad Ali quote that says, it isn't the mountains ahead to climb that wear you out. It's the pebble in your shoe. So sort of this idea that it can be small things, small emotional distresses that are holding you back or preventing you from achieving whatever it is that you want to achieve in your life. It can also be larger things, and ICT is capable of holding larger subjects as well or deeper subjects. Um, so we ask for people to share those pebbles that are in their shoes. And from our gathering of pebbles, we ask uh, the community to vote on the one pebble that was contributed that speaks to them the most in this moment. So not the most urgent pebble or the pebble that they feel the most sorry for, but the one that resonates with that individual in that moment for whatever reason, you know, it could be that they just really want to talk about that and think about that subject, or maybe they're experiencing something exactly along those same lines as that theme. Step three is where we ask the person who contributed their pebble that was um, voted, that received the most votes, to share more deeply about their emotional experience. This is really where we ask questions about how the situation, how that pebble is making the person feel. And this is really where we get the emotional articulation that um, allows people to exercise and build an emotional literacy that we really see as valuable practice from this, uh, from this method. We then move to step four, and step four is sort of where the orchestra comes together, um, where we, we ask the community to share, based on their own experience, a time when they went through something similar to the person who shared their original pebble. And then the key uh, moment from there is that we also ask each person in the room to share a strategy for how they overcame that struggle. So it's really asking people to articulate not only their emotional experience, but also the tools and resources that they were able to develop in response to that struggle. And it can range from internal tools, so rewriting our own narratives, um, thinking about something or approaching something in a different way, or, you know, deciding that that thing is no longer important. Um, but it can also be external, so either interpersonal, relying on a friend or family member, or institutional. You know, I decided to go to, um, you know, uh, an institution like like I went to church or I went to my social worker or some sort of other ex further external resource. So it's a range of resources and all of them are right. There's no wrong answer. And it's also not meant to be one size fits all or fits all for what solution is provided. So we don't expect that the person who brought their pebble to the room will necessarily want to use every single strategy that's uh, that's contributed in step four. Even if you walk away feeling like none of those resources are resources that you'll ever use, just the simple fact of sharing our stories, sharing our lived experiences within a group, and hearing other people give the gift of sharing their story with you makes people feel um, united, in harmony, uh, in, in a cause, in their community. The simple exercise of being there that gives people a positive experience and positive outcomes, as we've found. So that's step four. Step five is all about sharing the things that we plan to take away from the experience. So something that someone shared or a topic that was brought up. And what's key to this step and what I love about it, I think it's absolutely genius, is that not only does the individual share what they're taking away with them, but they're asked to share who gave them the gift of that learning or that, that contribution. And they're asked to thank that person, to, to show gratitude for the gift that they were given um, by name. 
So the folks who brought something to the room get to see the impact of their words, of their story and their experience on the other people in the community. So we, it's, it's a really beautiful process. Um, and I also think, you know, of course, it's hard to imagine being a participant when you're describing the steps um, because it is such a, it's an engaging process. It's an emotional process. And it's, it's, it can be very, um, very visceral in a way that, you know, just hearing about it intellectually has a hard time touching on. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a, a fascinating kind of pooling of resources and and it's a lot of what I've been finding in my dissertation as well, especially the sort of community storytelling aspects. So I think that you've both kind of talked about how you became interested in ICT, but I am curious if uh, either of you would have anything to say about contrasting it with existing models of mental health care in the U.S., We've talked about the idea that this handles, you know, anywhere from 15 to 40 people. It lasts about an hour and a half. Sometimes it can be shorter, 75 minutes. Not everybody speaks. Not everybody speaks. So the, the question, I think, another way to ask the question is, you know, in the way we think about doing treatment or therapy, right, we're either giving people meds um, you know, sometimes there's some kind of intervention or we're engaging them in, in, in some form of quote psychotherapy, but it's, it's usually, you know, the expectation is that everybody's going to talk, <laughs> right? That, that being there is to be a participant and active in this. And, and while I think talking and, and, uh, participating is, is really an important thing to do, you know, we are actually thinking that it's not just the talk that makes the biggest difference it actually may be the listening and the participation in that process of witnessing and listening that makes a difference. It's a little bit like if we had therapy where we had, where we conducted therapy, but we had other people sitting in the room just listening to the process of the therapy. You know, um, we don't, we don't, necessarily do that. And, and ICT really doesn't do that because we don't kind of want to focus on just one person. We want to try to think about how the challenge that they're facing has elements that uh, or other people in the same room face. Um, but the notion that, um, that it is the sort of uh, participating in and listening and beginning to be part of an emotional web, uh, a, a kind of feeling connection that I think is really what makes the difference. The people feel held and welcomed and they're part of something and they get to choose how much they participate in it at the moment. But if they are, if they're there and they're listening, which they're doing, um, then they're, then we believe that the whole community gains just as much as when the people talk. So, so that's a little bit of a difference than routine therapy. Obviously, the size of it is much different than how we tend to think of it. And the reason I wanted to go on about the people who were not talking um, and who were just listening is that we, have a, we tend to have a very individualistic model of how we approach psychiatric challenges. So, you know, even when we think that the people don't have the problem, but the problem is around them or on them, um, we still act as though it's the person who who it is all by themselves and that there's no real connection to anything else. Um, and and this is a beginning, I think, of getting to a place where we um, we see the whole web of people as having a challenge and having a need to learn how amongst themselves be able to live their emotional lives, express those emotional lives, share those emotional lives, and feel okay in doing that. I'd just like to add, I think for me, the biggest difference is that it asks people to show up even if they don't have some sort of pathology that they're dealing with. So there's no pathologizing in the integrative community therapy context. Facilitators are not trained mental health professionals necessarily. They can be, but you don't have to be in order to become a facilitator. And so there's no diagnosis uh, occurring. There's no um, 
professional advice being given or expertise being contributed. Uh, Dr. Bajeto always says, you know, the only expert in the room is you because you're the expert of your own experience. And so I think part of what makes that so unique is because we're not approaching this from the idea that, you know, everyone who shows up at ICT is necessarily very sick. Um, and that, you know, maybe you just show up because you like seeing people and you want to be in community and feel that warmth. Um, it's not sad. I mean, it's a very joyful experience at the end of the day. There can be hard moments where people are expressing, you know, deep emotional pain, but the community is there to bring healing and ultimately like liberation and uh, levity and joy back into that person's life and into the community's life. And so it really like there's music and we, you know, we dance and we make jokes and we tell stories and we always finish with a song. It's a very, it's a, it's a joyful process, even though it is also a place where people share their hardships. And I think that that's really different from how people assume therapy is meant to be, um, because I think people think you're supposed to go to therapy when you're sad and when you're really, really struggling and have a hard, having a hard time. And not that you can't engage in integrative community therapy when you do feel that way, because it is meant to be a space for people who are experiencing those emotions, but it it isn't just sadness. It isn't just sort of toiling and like hard, uh, you know, deep inner work. It's also a lot of joy and fun and lightness that occurs when you can be with other people who celebrate in your culture um, and and feel familiarity with the with the cultural signifiers that your community uh, brings to a space. So I, I think for me, that's kind of one of the things. Like I walk away from ICT saying, like that wasn't that didn't just feel really good. That was fun. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm curious about the the reception, uh, sort of bringing this practice from Brazil to the U.S. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about individualism and the need for community. Uh, some, and I've read that you've trained 35 facilitators so far. Uh, so, but I'm curious if if you've run into any maybe culture specific challenges uh, bringing it to the U.S. Yes, I would definitely say we've run into some challenges. You know, I think there's a lot of perhaps, you know, something something that goes along with the individualistic nature of American culture also comes with a lot of skepticism. And so there's uh, a desire to see proof of effective you know, outcomes for this type of approach. I mean, I think particularly coming from Brazil, where they do a lot of qualitative research as opposed to quantitative research. I read an article the other day that said, uh, did sort of a meta, uh, meta-analysis of the literature on ICT. And it showed that something like 85% of the research that's been done has been qualitative. And so people in the U.S. really want to see numbers, they want to see data, they want to see randomized clinical trials. But, you know, we see that we as a nation and our uh, mental health services are so drastically failing the people in this country that, you know, if there is evidence in Brazil, which there is evidence, um, then it's worth trying because this is a it's a structure that's been, you know, not only built but developed over decades now that has spread successfully across a country that's actually really similar to the U.S. in so many ways. Um, I think we don't give Brazil enough credit for that, but it's almost, you know, besides what hemisphere we're in, you can really like overlay so many of the demographics of Brazil right on top of the U.S. And so, um, so I think that's where we find a lot of the skepticism. And then, you know, I think people 
people are not familiar with the idea of sharing personal experiences and emotional experiences in a group. Um, and it can be really vulnerable. It can be difficult, particularly, I think, for men uh, to be willing to acknowledge an emotion that is a little bit taboo for them to feel and particularly to do that in sort of a public space. Um, one of the one of the guidelines, community guidelines that ICT uses is that we say, you know, this is not a space to share secrets. Um, not that you can't share deep, meaningful, emotional experiences, but that if it's a secret that you want it to remain a secret, we are in a public space. We, you know, people can come and go as they please. So there is no HIPAA compliance here. Um, we can't, you know, we can't enforce that. And so I think people approach that also with some fear and reticence because they don't know what the outcome will be. They don't know if it's going to be a positive impact if they choose to be vulnerable in that space. So I think those are some of the places that we've seen a little bit of resistance. However, I do think that in a lot of ways, this is such an intuitive process that once people show up and they start participating, it all, it almost just falls out of them because we all have been going through such extreme, um, you know, global trauma that people really, really need to engage in these kinds of conversations. So when they show up, they do it. Um, but I think it's about getting folks to show up, getting folks to understand what what it is. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Why is this helpful? Um, I think those kinds of questions and, and just the stigma of going to therapy, you know, the word therapy itself can be a barrier in our, in our uh, culture. I guess I would add to that, that uh, a couple things that are also part of the cultural uh, transformation or translation, um, you know, it's it's hard to get a new form of doing anything up and running. Um, so, um, so I guess it's not surprising that we're bringing something that's relatively new and running into some challenges in doing that. Um, but the, uh, the, the, Alice already mentioned the, uh, the issues around the outcome and, you know, it's, it's not only just the qualitative aspects of the outcome, it's the, it's the unit of the outcome. Right, we're we are actually thinking as as we've suggested talking to you, Micah, that this has actually got a community level outcome as much as it does an individual level outcome or many individual level outcomes. So, how do you measure a community level outcome? And who even has thought that that was important? Right, in the United States, so individualistic, we usually don't even think about that as a as a as a, a blanket concern. Um, another challenge that has been related to the newness is, you know. Um, and, and, uh, you know, so far we've kept the, uh, ICT that we've done free of charge and we, we would like to do that. We do see this as a community benefit that is part of, um, uh, of a way that people can use and learn how to manage and deal with their emotions in, in a community and how the community learns to manage the emotions that it has as a community. Um, making people pay money to do that is going to make that challenging. Um, doing things like, you know, branding this or trying to, you know, commercialize this also makes that challenging, right? Um, it's a society which is based on things getting branded. We're not really keen on getting it branded. We really want to see this notion of solidarity care kind of emerge as a as a, a way of thinking in which ICT is part of a larger scope of activity, peer supports, and other kinds of community and community efforts that support and promote um, healthy and and uh, supportive relationships between people. We want to see that happen, but getting there is 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 uh, going to be a challenge. And then I guess one last piece. You know, uh, the, the, the favela, uh, Quatro Veras, um, in uh, Brazil has been working with Alberto, you know, for 30 years plus. It's getting close to 40 years. And we're the first group that has brought this method into the United States. There are over 40,000 facilitators in Brazil. That's 40,000 that have been trained. There are facilitators now in most of the countries in Latin America. There are facilitators now coming up in Europe, in Africa, and Asia. And um, 
now we are bringing some of this to the United States, it's not a small thing to jump from Portuguese to English. I think that's been a challenge. Um, but I suspect that even more so, and it relates to the evidence, but I also bet it relates to um, sort of um, cultural condescension, that uh, the idea that you could bring uh, a, a process that was invented in, uh, in Brazil to the United States is like, well, why would anybody ever want to do that, right? <laughs> what's, what's that for? And I think, you know, the fundamental thing that really, that, that Alberto and the favela, the folks in the favela did, was that they recognized that mother, uh, necessity had to be the mother of invention. They had to think of some way to move to a different place because the, the capacity that they had otherwise was never going to be close to what they needed to do. And I'm not going to claim that they've necessarily solved the problem of mental health by any means. But I think they're a little bit closer in their capacities as a result of this. In the United States, as Alice said before, and even as President Biden has said, we're in a mental health crisis. We are seeing folks, even before the pandemic, people were, you know, isolated, uh, disconnected. There were high, you know, we were having increased rates of suicide. We were having, you know, massive amounts of deaths from uh, overdoses. And, you know, we've had those, the, the deaths of despair um, kind of afflicting entire communities all across the country. We've continued to have trouble with folks who've got longstanding psychiatric challenges and more and more people with psychiatric challenges being created every day in the social system that we have. So how the heck are we going to get ahead of that if we don't start trying to be innovative and if we don't look for resources where the resources are? And the resources, this is the thing I think that's the critical thing to figure out, is the resources are in the people. We have to figure out how to help them unleash them. We don't always know what our own resources are, but we do know that they're there if we can help people find them and use them and express them. And that's, I think, what ICT has kind of really shown, is it? It's, it's peer support at the next level up. It's going to the community with peer support. And I think... Um, um, Alice, Alice has come up with a couple of good ways to describe this whole process. One way is that she describes it as uh, Brazilians. Brazilians. So, so, so you get resilience and Brazil put together. And then the other one is that she will describe it as yoga for the mind. That you go and you participate in this and it gives you an opportunity to stretch your feelings, to exercise your capacity for compassion, to exercise your capacity for solidarity, to exercise your ability to imagine and think about your own life and how it relates and connects to other people. And that's, that's something that I think is a real value. One of the other people that I interviewed is um, liberation psychologist Mary Watkins, um, and I, I hear a lot of similar sort of principles uh, around, you know, dialogical types of thinking and uh, horizontality of relationships and all this stuff. Uh, I am curious about ICT's sort of, you know, intellectual background, and I know that um, You've mentioned Gregory Bates and, and Paulo Freire as big influences there. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Paulo Freire is a Brazilian, one of the founders of, uh, of uh, really liberation psychology in the, in the world of education. Um, folks may know him from having written a book in the 1970s called A Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in which he talked very much about the horizontality of uh, the teacher student relationship in which the student is the teacher and the teacher is the student. And in that context, the attention to the uh, context that people are living in as the motivator for people to learn. So his, his big claim to fame was that he worked with the campesinos in Brazil and helped them become literate by, by helping them have conversations about the real circumstances in which they lived, which motivated them both to learn, uh, you know, to learn language and, and to read, but also motivated them to have deep abiding discussions, what they called conscientization um, in, in, the, in the community. So people could begin to think and talk about the circumstances that they were in. So Alberto will say that ICT is really a, a conscientization around emotions. 
It's, it's emotional literacy. It's helping people find ways to express and talk about the feelings that they have and to share those and to develop. Alice kind of alluded to this before, that people in a community begin to develop a, a kind of alphabet of emotions by sharing and being in connection with each other, that they can begin to feel and connect and understand each other in ways that they weren't able to do before. So um, some people have come to us and said, well, you know, once they've, once you've done this, are you ready for the, if you do an ICT, are you ready for the revolution? And what we, you know, have you organized the meeting for the revolution as a result of ICT? And, and what I would say to that is no, not necessarily, but what you've gotten is people who are ready to do the work that they have to do in their lives and in their communities. They've developed the relationships that will allow them to do whatever kind of political or organizational or social um, or, or faith-based work that they need to do to make their lives a better place. So it's sort of the, it's sort of the foundation, the emotional foundation of the work that folks can do with themselves and with others to move their world and their lives in a different place. The other part of this uh, that relates to Conscientis is that it also, ICT asks people to claim their narrative um, by telling the story of their lived experience. And the theory behind that, um, going back to Paulo Freire, is that once a person can, you know, own their story, they become the subject of history as opposed to the object, which in, you know, uh, historically in these agricultural uh, communities, the folks living there and, you know, in favelas as well were sort of people who were history was sort of operating through, but elites and the, you know, government uh, uh, leaders were the ones who were actually the subjects of history. You know, they were the ones who we not, we need to tell stories about and we need to, you know, the, the arc of history is based on their experience. But when we get people to exercise their ability to tell their stories, they start to claim their place in history, which, you know, on a community level means that we can get an entire community community to claim their subjectivity within history. And so that is a population-based uh, approach to allowing people to see that their emotional experience actually influences the way that society carries out its processes. And thus, it empowers them or gives them the um the autonomy to create change in their society. So the idea is that we start by getting people to be able to see themselves as part of the story so that they can begin to change it. The Gregory Basin piece that falls right from that is that in telling those stories, in communicating those stories, you start to have a, a system of relationships formed that are interdependent with each other and related to each other. And as the capacity grows in one end, that begins to shift the circumstances and the stories and the, and the communications in others. So the whole process is an evolving whole that is, you know, you perturb it in one place and then the process just starts to grow um, and, and take off in that sense. So it's really kind of a, a systems theory that it is not... This, this is the part that's the hardest to kind of grasp from an individualistic thing. This is not about you go to ICT and you go to ICT and you get the solution to your problem. You might. You might get some feeling of support and emotional uh, connection. You might as well. Those are all important things and we, we don't deny them. But on top of that, you may actually be participating in the creation of a network of humans connecting and st storytelling and communicating with each other that has systematic effects that go beyond even the process that brought you in there as a single person in the first place. And cultural anthropology plays into this. That's why we play music or ask people to share sort of culturally relevant prayers or sayings or um, jokes or readings, because 
what Dr. Bajeto talks about is how people relate to each other based on their sort of shared cultural background. And so once we allow people to see those same cultural signifiers, share in those same, uh, you know, lived experiences that we all kind of see as we're growing up in a similar community, that familiarity breeds the, the it builds the web. It, bil- it creates the ties that we then use to trust each other, to rely on each other, to bu- to continue to build the community uh, s- social networks that we're we are attempting to build through ICT. So it's kind of it's building the context in which people feel comfortable sharing, but it's also creating a new community sense because those are the things that when we go through each ICT round in that space, we're always going to go back to those same signifiers. Um, like we use that Muhammad Ali quote all the time because it's uh, it's now become embedded in the culture of our ICT rounds. Um, and I think one of the really wonderful things about ICT is that it is so culturally responsive. And so, you know, Dr. Bajeto says, whatever the language is that you need to use throughout the steps that is appropriate for that space and that community is the language that you should use. Um a really good example is so Sylvia uh, London and uh, Irma Nieka Rodriguez. We all call her Nieka. They were hosting a round in Houston, Texas, but they are originally from Mexico City, and so they were hosting the round sort of based on what Araberto had taught them as the language to use uh, in step one, which is the language of celebrations. So we say. I invite you now, anybody who has something that they would like to celebrate, please share with us today. And the people in the room that they were hosting this round were silent. They heard crickets. And so, you know, they didn't really understand that. Um, They did it a couple more times using the language of celebration. And they really just didn't, they would meet a wall every time they used that word. So they decided to try to switch it to what do you feel grateful for? And once they switched it to a sense of gratitude, the room opened up. So I kind of talk about this as like a a lock and a key. So you have to find the right key to fit the lock that opens the door into that community's ability to communicate or feel safe or share in the way that ICT asks them to do. And it's not going to be the same across every single community or culture. It's actually always going to be different. Um, and it takes a little bit of, it, it absolutely takes familiarity with the culture itself. So, you know, that's why we try to train people who are going to conduct these rounds within their communities, as opposed to coming from outside, because those are the people who are going to know the words that work, the culture that works, the music that works to bring people into a place where they feel comfortable sharing, feeling vulnerable, feeling vulnerable with each other, trusting each other enough to move through uh, with authenticity and openness. Thank you. So I, I did want to say that the political and sort of critical element here uh, is really interesting to me um, because my work is actually at the intersection of how group forms of healing can sort of help people build solidarity toward social justice, social change. Uh, So very, very common goals there. So I'm curious if either of you or both of you uh, have any experiences kind of within ICT that you'd like to talk about as facilitators, as participants, or things that you've seen from other people. In our early days, we didn't have a lot of people who knew about ICT who we could kind of bring into an ICT round. And and we used to do them just to keep practicing with, with people in in our family. And not, not large rounds. And we're not talking like 15 people. We're talking smaller. So you can actually do these even in, in, in a relatively small group. And, and we've done that. Um, one of those groups involved my, my mother, who's 95 years, almost 95. Um, and she was on this with um, she was in this with um, my 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 kids, um, and she talked about the thing the pebble that was in her mind was that she knows she's ninety four years old approaching ninety five, 
and that she knows that her time on Earth is not going to last necessarily much longer. And she just wanted to be able to, you know, say that she thinks about that and she wants to communicate to the kids that, you know, that um, uh, she loves them a lot and that she is ready for this. And this is something that, um, that she can pass on to them as something that uh, um, they can learn to be ready for, too. And I got to tell you, it was just overwhelming. And I, for me, and, and I don't know how my children felt about it, um, but we've had kind of similar situations of, of, you know, real depth people in very serious medical challenges who they've had to deal with. We've had folks with very serious interpersonal relationships that they've dealt with, family issues, a whole range of different kinds of things that have been... Um, talked about and and people have expressed and found um i think i've heard um in those conversations ways of thinking about things that were really kind of opened my eyes a little bit and made me think and feel somewhat differently um we've also had a lot of talk about the times that we live in um you know dealing with covid dealing with the ongoing you know the situation with war dealing with the george floyd circumstances, all the feelings that come with that. Um, all those things have been every single time, both touching and um, meaningful. Um, and people are people are amazingly good at talking about how they manage to deal with challenges um, in ways that really is heartening. Um, at the same time, they can express really depths of, of deep despair. So yeah, I think the sort of flip side of that is I feel that I've seen people be so generous with their love and spirit when someone is, has shared a really deep struggle in a way that I I hardly ever see in any other context. People are so inclined to just come to the support of the person who is struggling or showing a really deep emotion uh, and and with, you know, just love and generosity and warmth. And, um, and that, I think that's been one of the most inspiring things to me. I will share that one of my first rounds I ever did it was actually through the group that I first started doing ICT with in English, um, a group of mental health professionals, largely American expats who practice in Geneva, Switzerland. But one of the subjects that came up, I don't remember who brought it up, who, who brought up the pebble. Um, I believe it was a woman who had come in from uh, an African-American woman who was uh, coming, uh, joining the Zoom from Maryland had said something about how she was really struggling with, you know, what the murder of George Floyd said about American culture. And we proceeded to have one of the most beautiful conversations of people sharing these horrible, traumatizing experiences with racism or xenophobia. And one woman who was from Scotland actually shared that her high school boyfriend, who was Irish Catholic, had been murdered in a terrorist attack. And what she shared with us, her way of overcoming was to, at like age 14, was to start a um, a fundraising program that uh, they held events annually to essentially bring together Catholic and Protestant communities um, and build community in response to this ethnic war. And to hear the international perspective, to hear all of these people talk about ways that they too were struggling with the horrible things that humans can do to each other and that societies can do to each other. 
and also the beautiful ways that people have come through those types of challenges. It was just, it was more profound than I could have prepared for on like a Tuesday morning. Um, I'm tearing up about it, just remembering the experience. And that was one of the moments where I was like, this is something really special. I think things like that happen all the time. In ICT, we find that, you know, people who never thought in a million years that they could connect on something actually have a very deep commonality and and are so grateful to hear another person speak about it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I just want to thank you both for your time and for the work that you're doing in bringing ICT to the U.S. Uh, personally, professionally, I feel like community-based, non-pathologizing, horizontal approaches like this are sorely needed. So uh, I appreciate it. Uh, so just as a final question, you know, what's on the horizon for both of you? And maybe that's to do with ICT or something else or both. I am in the middle of a big change. Uh, I'm going to be starting my psychiatry residency at the University of Texas in Austin, Dell Medical School. Um, in the meantime, I'm actually helping to put together the first integrative community therapy in-person training for facilitators that'll be taking place this April 20th through the 23rd in, uh, in Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh. We're partnering with the Center for Latin American Studies, who have great graciously offered to host Dr. Bajeto. Um, so we'll be doing our, our very first in-person training. We're so excited. I'm going to like actually get to meet Dr. Bajeto in person. Um, so, and also, you know, a bunch of our, the folks from our first training cohort will be joining us from out of town. Um, we're going to bring some new folks in and hopefully do some really meaningful uh, work to help these folks know how to facilitate, but also do a little bit of their own emotional processing uh, about, you know, how to be in groups. So we're really excited about that. We're also hosting um, for the next year uh, our second virtual training for ICT facilitators. Um, so that's an ongoing training. We've got 25 participants, students who we're working with, and we've just been having such a lovely time. Folks joining us from all over the country, uh, San Francisco, New Orleans, Philadelphia. Um, and so we're really, I'm really enjoying that process as well. And I think we're just, we're, we're in the process of, you know, getting a Visible Hands Collaborative on its own two feet um, to really establish this as the Integrative Community Therapy Institute of the U.S. and to start integrating other types of solidarity care. And, and I think we're just, we're on this journey. We're on an adventure and we're, we're seeing where it goes. <laughs> That's exactly where we are. And um, we're making uh, Visible Hands Collaborative a 501c3, and that means we have to find funding and resources to continue to grow the number of ICT facilitators. We have to figure out what kind of an ecology they're going to practice in, you know, and how can they make money. In Brazil, they finally, after many years, got uh, ICT to be one of the services of the Brazilian Primary Health Services of the National Health Service. So they have... Um, they have ways to support it um, and continue to grow it across the country. Uh, if you go see a primary uh, care provider in uh, in Brazil and you present with some challenge that you're having in your life, the uh, there's a good chance that that primary care provider will refer you to the ongoing ICT meeting that happens at two o'clock in the in the church um, basement. Um, or, or in the church uh, courtyard, to uh, to kind of go participate and uh, and see uh, and see how it might help you. So we're looking for ways to make it grow. How to how to help more people get engaged with it. Uh, folks who are interested in hearing more about it, if they go to www.visiblehandscollaborative.org, they can uh, connect up with us. So we'd love to hear from people and get people engaged if they'd like to. And uh, I guess maybe I'll end with a, a statement from uh, uh, from Alberto. Alberto says, "When the mouth is silent, the body suffers, and when the mouth speaks, the body heals." 
And um, we also believe that when the, the mind listens and participates and expresses and connects with other people, it also heals. So we're just hoping to bring as much of that as we can to, uh, to the U.S. Absolutely. Thank you both. Thank you, Micah. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.